But Father, that you would confirm the word spoken by signs and wonders in everybody's life. And the church said, Amen. go ahead and be seated. Amen. Guys, I came packing tonight. Amen. I got some scripture. And I, I got excited. You know, I, you know, it's it's weird when you come into a Christian church yeah. and people are telling me that they're Christians and I, I get a passion Bible and then they try to steal it from me. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with this church. That's right. You know, God forgive them and it says don't cover your neighbor's Bible. That's right. Because people who love don't do that. Don't cover my Bible. Don't cover it, you know. And, and the pastor, I think you were kind of, you, you were too quick to grab it. You know, it's like, I, it's like my new toy and I couldn't even enjoy it. You snatched it out of my hands. Just lay your hands up. You know, guys, I'm going to be straight with you. I think a lot of times in today's world, the church is trying to answer questions that people aren't asking. And a lot of, you know, I read the Message Bible, I read the uh, the Passion Bible, because I want to be able to speak a language to touch the millennial generation. And I believe that the cultural destruction or the uh, discouragement that's happening in this world is happening because it's our watch. And I think any time that cur when cultural discouragements go up, it's because lack of revival in the church and the lack of the prophetic goes down. Because a proclaimed prophetic word will do exactly what you tell it to do. So a lot of times we shrink back because we're afraid. And God has called everybody in a time and season such as now to, to strengthen, encourage, and comfort people through the word of God. And it's not just Bible and verse. It's learning how to love people first and speaking a relational word that will restore people. That's why you continually hear me say, John 3, 17, it says that Jesus came to make lives right again. That's good. He came to make it right. He's a God that restores people. Yeah. And the thing that you'll always hear out of my mouth, there, there is no garbage and there's always room for a comeback in your life. I don't care what you said, what you've done. It doesn't matter. God is still going to restore you. Grace is still going to lift you up. And your future still looks better. Amen. God is always going to put a door in your life in the midst of any situation and give you grace to get out of your mess. But we have to learn to start connecting with Him. It's too often that people ask for the benefits without staying connected. They're not part of the corporation, but they want the benefits. And it doesn't work that way. We have to get a connection to God and the, the invitation for the connection is always there. So I want to talk tonight about renting versus owning. Thank you, Jesus. Because there's a difference. Glory. You see, I have a, a rental house. That's right. And you can't remove the fixtures in my house without my permission. Why? Because you don't own it, I do. That's right. You can't do certain things to that house because I already have it in writing that you can't do it. You can't paint. You can't do any of those things. All you can do is live there. But anything else beyond that requires my permission. Why? Because I own it. Now, I can do what I want to that house because I own it. But when you're renting, your authority in that place is extremely limited. Good. Good, and God is trying to get everybody into ownership. Amen. And in fact, he would shake you to try and get it into your life. But you've got to let some things go. Right. God will shake the shakeable in your life. Amen. And there's a lot of times people go through a dry season in life. And God is trying to draw near to you in those closest seasons because I've never learned anything from my season of success. I've learned everything in life from my failures. It's in my failures I've stepped in and spent more time praying with God and, and trying to figure out how I got in this mess. What's the word? How do I get out? Who are the people that are going to be involved? And I've grown so much in the midst of my failures that allowed me to step into success. We have to learn to trust God to be able to get out of that dry season in life. Amen. But we have to be able to learn to start trusting God. Glory to God. I like Hebrews 5.14. And I'm going to turn to a couple scriptures. I've, I've marked them. And uh, anytime you need faith, go to, the, go to the book of Hebrews and start reading Hebrews. Yeah. Hebrews will pump you up. <laughs> Glory to God. Um, I had a guy come over to my house and I was talking about dreams. Like I said, people are asking questions that that or answering questions that, that, that people aren't really asking. So I provoke people because I want to speak to them and, and just address them and love them and, and give them a word. 
and I, I had a little thing going on in my house. I have a bunch of men over there, and all of a sudden I started talking about dream interpretation. Now, most of the people that weren't in my house, they were people that, you know, they don't go to church. But that's the reason I bring them over, because I want to give them some bait, and I want to, you know, get these guys connected. And so I got a guy, when I was talking about dream interpretation, I got a guy come up, and he started asking me, you know, hold on a second. It was kind of weird, because he doesn't go to church. He's a real quiet guy, and he was like, I, ha I have a dream. I said, okay, cool, what's your dream? He goes, I have it all the time. I said, I know, most people have repetitious dreams, but they don't understand it, so it continues to be repetitious. And I said, well, what's your dream? He goes, well, I always have this dream that, you know, I had a red barn and it got faded, so it was kind of faded red, and behind the barn there was, there was four trees, but the trees were dead, and right after that I always see a wave come over the top, and it freezes, and all of a sudden the dream ends. I said, oh, that's an easy dream. And I said, do you know that God's been speaking to you for years? But I said, as soon as I speak over you, I said, something is going to unlock in your life. And he says, oh, okay, well, what's the dream? I said, right now you're in a place of financial pain. I said, you were in a place of financial prosperity, and that was a big red barn, and it was a storehouse. I said, but right now you're in a place of financial pain. In fact, I, I said, it hurts you so bad that it affected your family. I said, those trees represented your kids. And I said, your kids are dying because of your, 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 your situation and your finances. I said, but the wave that came over the top of you was the judgment of God, that God is going to work everything out. God is a God that's restoring. And I said, the reason that wave uh, froze over the top of you is because the Lord would tell you that the thoughts and the attitudes that God has towards you and your restoration will remain unchanged. Yeah. And he was like, well, well, since that day, he's never had that dream again. Why? Because he understood it. And after that, you can ask my wife, he's making well into six figures yeah. and God released him into a season of prosperity. He's not in the church. But he knows where the word came from. Right. But it's about being relevant with people and start asking the questions and start connecting them to the issues. Good. Well, how do we connect with people? I said, go to Hebrews 5.14. It says, solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So there is a discernment. And discernment is the first step of the prophetic in your life to be able to acknowledge good from evil. A lot of times, 75% of us are going to recognize what the evil and say something is wrong in that person's life. The word of God into the ability that you have to retain the word of God and get the word of God in you is going to impact your level of discernment in your life. So you'll be able to step into a situation and recognize heaven from hell or good from evil in somebody else's life based on your ability to connect with the word. And that's what it's saying to mature and it's saying to understand the word of God because to the degree that you do it and you press into this thing is to the degree that the prophetic is going to flow in through your life. God doesn't speak outside the boundaries of his word. Yeah. That's why it's important to understand the heart of God and the nature of God. Anytime there's communication from me to you, you'll understand my nature, yeah. right? Yeah. If I'm always talking about restoration, it's like, oh, that guy really believes in that restoration thing. Well, I believe if he prays for me, I'm going to get healed. Well, when I start listening to the voice of God, all of a sudden I start understanding his nature and what he's about. Yeah. That God loves me unconditionally. It's not about what I do. It's not about all this stuff. It's not about jumping through hoops. It's learning to rest in a position called being a son. Good, good. And that's it. Everybody wants to know, what's my purpose in life? Come on. What do you think God has called me to do? I got people that call me this all, all the time and they're like, you know, what's my purpose? What am I called to do? And I'm like, who cares? Yeah. And I said, I tell people all the time, I've done this twice this week. I said, do you know why God hasn't spoken to me about your position or your title in life? And they're like, why? Because you don't understand your position as a son. Why don't you figure that out and figure out your position as a son by getting in the word and understanding how much your father loves you. Yeah. When you understand your position of, as a son, then God can start sending you out to doing things and, and create a function in your life called a title. Until then, you're not going to get a title on your life. Your title right now is called son, and you always have to return to that. I don't care if you call to be a pastor, what you call to be, you've got to return to that place called sonship or being a daughter. Yeah. Primarily, that's who you are. That's good. But that's why getting in the Word of God is so important in your life. That's right. So God wants to first get you in alignment. And I'm going to teach you about answered prayer. Because I opened up with John, and I said, if you remain in me, my word remains in you. Ask for what it is that you will, yeah. and God says, I'm going to do it for you. Yeah. So God says, I'm going to answer every single prayer. Well, what is he saying? He's saying, ask prayers according to my word, and I'm going to do it in your life. Yeah. Well, what does the word of God say about your issue? Yeah. It doesn't say, go complain. No. It doesn't say, go find somebody else that, you know, that is going to help heal you. It said, no, get in the word, establish a relationship with God, get into your Holy place, yeah. your prayer closet. I know it sounds crazy, but I get up every morning and I read the Word. 
That's right. That sounds crazy, but I pray. Do you know 5% of Christians pray? Yeah, that's right. That's just kind of a scary ratio. Do that. Mm -hmm. Very few, but they don't see the results. And if you get out of prayer and your life is not transformed, guys, you're not doing it right. That's right. Good. If you walk out of prayer with the same fear that you had when you walked in, you're not doing it right. Good. Your prayer life is probably all about worrying, complaining, and all this stuff about you. Yes. And it's not enough about somebody else and God moving through you. And, and, and what I said on Sunday is you've got to start making declarations over other people's lives. Because in order for it, get to, for it to get in their life, it's got to get in your life first. Right. Amen? Amen? So I'm going to talk about alignment. In 1 Samuel, there was this lady named Hannah. Hannah was awesome. Yeah. Her husband loved her. She had everything. But what she had was a concubine that always messed with her and said, hey, you're barren, you can't produce. Yeah. And every time that she heard that, it destroyed her. Come on. It destroyed her emotionally. Everything else was working in her life, but there was a, one thing that she went to God about, and she always cried to God about. She's like, I just want a son, and I'm barren. Come on. I just want a son. That's it. Well, what you don't understand is Israel was jacked up at the time. Israel was messed up. Yeah. Israel was being misled. Why? There was no prophetic voice. Why? Because the priest named Eli and his kids were jacked up. Mm -hmm. So you got jacked up people that are trying to atone for a nation. And when the offerings are coming in, his kids, instead of going and just poking it once and getting the offering after it cooked, they went before and they're like, well, God doesn't need this and give it all to me because I'm hungry right now. Yeah. And people stood up and they said, well, what about God? And he was like, what about God? I'm hungry. So they completely blew it off. But all of a sudden, the lack of prophetic in their life because they were in sin affected the whole nation. Yeah. So you've got a one Hannah that's crying, oh my God, I want a son. And you've got a God, excuse me, and you've got God who's also crying out saying, I need to get Eli out of here and I need a prophet for a nation. I'm teaching about answer prayer. By mistake, Hannah aligned her heart with God's heart. That's good. She said, I need a son. And God says, I need a prophet. <laughs> and Hannah goes to God and says, God, if you give me a son, I'm creating covenant with you. If you give me a son, I will give him to you. I will dedicate him to you. And he will be your man, your prophet. And I'm going to just release him into your life. That's so good. Man. So good. And God says... Oh my God, I've been waiting for someone like this all my life. Someone who actually finally found my heart's desire. I've been wanting to raise up a prophet in this nation. And Hannah, you win. You got the lottery ticket. Oh my God, you're the first one that prayed for that. And all of a sudden now God says, I'm going to partner with you. So she goes before Eli. Eli says, oh, you're drunk. Woman, get out of here. And she's like, no, I'm not drunk. I'm just crying out to God and I want a kid. And he prayed and he said, God, give her what she wishes. Now, because Eli's kids were eating up the offering, there was a prophet that came to Eli and said, you're all going to die, except for one of you. All of you are going to die. You're going to see the blessing in the land, but you'll never enjoy it. You're all going to die. So all of a sudden, Eli has been warned, the prophet and the priest, about what's going to happen to his life, and there was no repentance over his life. He kept doing what he was doing. The kids kept doing what they were doing. And all of a sudden, Hannah gives birth to a Samuel. Wow. And Samuel... Is dedicated to the house. Yeah. Just as she said. Hannah had three more children after that. Yeah. But she did give one away. And she wow. gave a Samuel away. Yeah. And they were going to bed one night. And God started calling. A Samuel. Yeah. And Samuel finally responded to the voice. He said yes Lord. Mm -hmm. And God told him what was going to happen to Eli. He was like six or seven years old. Glory. And Eli said tell me what God told you last night. He said don't hide anything. He said just shoot straight with me kid. Samuel looked at me and said, you're going to die. You and your whole household, you dishonored God. Yeah. All of a sudden, like that. wiped him out. But there was an alignment. I'm going to give you another picture about answering prayer. Oh, good. You were created for a God-given purpose. You better get this in you. Yeah. And when I talk covenant, don't mess with God on this one. Yeah. I sat there 22 years ago, and every time I opened up this Bible, I knew I was called to the ministry. All I heard was healing and restoration, healing and restoration, healing and restoration. Yeah. I don't know why that kept speaking to my heart. It didn't matter what page I turned to, healing and restoration. Good. I kind of caught a clue. I'm not that smart. I said, God, I said, what are you doing? Can you use me in this healing and restoration? Yeah. Just like Hannah. God looks at his son on the cross. My son died for sickness and disease. Mm. He bore it on his body. I love my son. 
I love him with everything. In sickness and disease took him out. I hate sickness and disease. Yeah. This is coming from God. I want to destroy it with everything in me. Good. And that's God's heart. Mm -hmm. Then I come in, I said, hey God, I just caught a clue. It's in my heart to serve you and it's in my heart to pray for the sick. Yeah. Do you think you can use me in that? And God says, I've been waiting for someone to ask me that question. Yeah. I hate sickness. I hate disease. I want to do something about it. I want to wipe it out of people's lives. You have the lottery ticket. You ask the number one prayer. I'm going to anoint you. Boom. <laughs> You're anointed. Good. God's looking for people to prosper in businesses. They're not looking for their own, but are looking to build the house of God. That's right. Jesus wore a crown of thorns, which represented the curse over humanity and their finances. Yeah. And it was another thing that took Jesus out. They mocked him. They beat him over the head. And God says, I hate poverty. I hate lack. And he's waiting for somebody to align their heart with him and say, God, can you raise me up in finances so I can help your house and help your cause and get your good news out into this nation to start changing some lives. And God's waiting for someone to ask that so he can say, you're anointed. Yeah. It's not hard. God is looking for people to align with him that don't have selfish motives. People that are looking to be other focused. People that believe God will get them out of their mess and change somebody else's life. But it starts aligning your prayers with his will. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask for whatever it is that you wish. And God says, I will do it. Align with him and you'll start seeing answered prayers. It's when the prayers are self-serving, they go unanswered. Me, 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 God. Me, 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 God. Yeah. You're not the end result of your prayer life. And I'm not trying to be angry or me, but I, I'm going to give it to you straight. I've been doing this thing for 22 years, guys. And it works in my life. I could not give you what I don't already own. I own revelations in the realm of the kingdom so I can release them into your life. It has to hit me before it hits you. It has to hit pastor. It has to hit bishop before it hits you. Because they own certain things. And understand this. When a pastor is up here preaching, it's just an invitation. All they're doing is they're giving you a revelation that they already possess. That's right. It's an invitation. Until you press into that word that pastor's carrying, you don't got it. That's right. You're getting your ears tickled. I got people standing around me all day. I'll prophesy. I'll give them the word and I'll tell them what it is. And I tell them, you don't own that yet. You got excited right now. Maybe you feel a little bit better. You got a little bit of goosebumps. But you don't have it yet. You don't own it. Why? Because you don't have a revelation yet. It's not in you. How do I know when it's in me? Because every storm can hit your life and you're still laughing at it. You don't have authority over a storm you can't sleep in. You don't have authority over the storm that you can't sleep in. Are you guys hearing me yet? When you get a revelation, all the hell can break out in your life and you'll sit there laughing at it. Because you have a revelation over something in your life. And you have ownership. Ownership will always give you authority. Let's talk about heart condition. I need a bigger pulpit, Pastor. Come on, let's get one. Let's prophesy this thing. I need a Cadillac. Double the side. Hebrews 6 and 7 says, and this is the Passion Version. It says, for men's hearts are just like the soil that drinks up the showers with which, which often falls upon it. Your heart will drink up anything. That you allow it to. And it will produce what you allow it to. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to yeah. prosper you. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you to give you hope in the future. Right. And in Hebrews 8, it's pretty phenomenal too. God says about that plan, he said, not only does he know the plan that he has for you, but this is interesting. God says, I'm making a new plan with Israel, but he's talking about you. It isn't going to be written on paper. It's not going to be chiseled in stone. This time, I'm writing out the plan in you. I'm carving it on the lining of your heart. I'll be your God. You'll be his people. They won't go to school and learn about me or buy a book called God and Five Easy Lessons. They'll get all, they'll, they'll all get to know me firsthand, the little and the big, the small and the great. They'll get to know me by being kindly forgiven with the slate of their sins forever wiped clean. By coming up with the new plan, a new covenant between God and his people. God put the old plan on the shelf. And there it stays gathering dust. So God took the voice away from judgment out of your life. He took the voice of condemnation out of your life. And God says it sits on the shelf. I don't pay attention to it. I don't even play with the thing anymore. Because I have a new covenant with you. It's a new plan. It's called grace. And I'm going to get you out of your mess. That's right. 
Good. And that's the plan of God for your life. Amen. So God says he knows the plan. Mark 11, 24 says, Whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe you receive it, and it shall be yours. And then it says in Proverbs 13, 12, it says, Hope deferred makes a heart sick. Yeah. Then it says, A desire fulfilled is a tree of life. What's the tree of life? It's living in your purpose. Outside of your purpose, there is no life. There's no sense of fulfillment. There's nothing. Good. You feel empty. You feel void. You feel like you missed the bus. Yeah. But God is going to restore you and he'll get you back to that place. Good. You know, it's interesting. My grandfather, I never met him. I never met my grandfather. He died two years before I was born. And this was solely on revelation. I asked God, I said, God, why are you using my life? He said, because your grandfather was called to be an apostolic pastor. He said, but your grandfather was an emotional cripple because of the alcohol and abuse in his life. And he was highly gifted, he was highly favored, but because of the emotional issues, he could never step out of his call. And God spoke to me, he said, what I put on your, his life, and what I put in his heart, I put in your heart. He said, you're gonna do the things that your grandfather was called to do, and you'll complete his work. And that's why there's gonna be double. But you know what's interesting? I talked to Pastor R. Freeman, his grandfather was called to the ministry. Pastor Darren, his grandfather was called to the ministry. Where did those things come from? It's generational. You have things in your heart. That are called desires that God planted before you were even created. Right. You know what's awesome about the prophetic? Is the prophetic word that goes into your heart immediately triggers what's called germination. Mm. Germination is when a dead seed comes to life and all of a sudden the right elements all come into play. It's the right heat, it's the right water, or the right word in the right time and season for that thing to break through the surface. That's where internal realities always become external realities. What's on the inside will always come on the outside. That's why Jesus said the poor you're always going to have with you. He's not talking about an external condition. He's talking to the heart of the person. Yeah. He's saying, hey, if you see that, you know, that they're going to Burger King and they're trying to buy a Whopper and they can't even afford, you know, whatever it is, value meal number eight. Yeah. He said, because it's a belief that's in their heart. That's right. Anytime someone's poor, there's lack of a word of God that's inside of them. That's good. Because anytime the word of God is inside of you, it's going to germinate. It's going to multiply and it's going to produce external results. That's good, right. But we have to step into that thing by faith. That's why it doesn't work with people. Because all of a sudden they get the word they believe, but there's no movement in it and there's no rest. Come on. And God is trying to get everybody into a position of rest, but it all starts in your heart. It starts with your alignment with God. It starts with your covenant with God. Yeah. So what you desire, God actually desires for you. So the thing that God put in your heart with a word, it is triggered prophetically, or it's just triggered through the word for that thing to germinate and to break through. Every desire in your heart is created to have an experience with God so he can co-create with you. You're not called to go down this road yourself. Yeah. God has every plan of prospery, but he's looking for your connection. He's looking for your alignment. He's looking for you to partner with him. Yeah. That's all he's looking for. Yeah. Once you start doing that and you get your daily word, the Bible says that God doesn't live, uh, man doesn't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4 and 4. Yeah. It also says, give us this day our daily bread. Well, what's God saying? I'm trying to invite you into this thing so I can get some things in your heart, get them in your life, so it'll we'll start producing results, and you have ownership and authority over certain things. Yeah. The Bible says, come to us who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Yeah. Another invitation. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. I know your needs, but seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. Seek it first. And it says everything will fall into place in your life. It's based on priority. Good. What is that? It's another invitation. What's the invitation for? The invitation is for ownership that you have certain things. You have authority over certain things in your life. Good. The awesome thing about being in the desert is it sucks. <laughs> right? Yeah. But Paul glorified in it. Because he knew that God was closer in your desert than any other place. Because God is trying to get grace in your life that you would just seek him. He can partner with you and he can get you out of that situation. Yeah. But he wants to give you ownership. When you have ownership, you have authority. When you have authority, you'll not only break out of that situation, yeah. you'll never go back. Right. Because it doesn't own you anymore. You own it. The blessing will always consume the curse. I was up here 22 years ago. I walked in the church. I was raised Catholic. One experience from God changed my theology about God. What are you talking about? I was in the soap aisles, aisle 13 in Larry's Market. And I remember I was in such an attack that night. I dealt with depression. I always walked around. I was sad. Yeah. 
That night, I kept hearing voices that wouldn't go away. You're never going to be nothing. You're never going to do anything. God's not going to use you. He doesn't think about you. Whatever it was, it came into my life. Come on. And all of a sudden, I say, I didn't know a lot of the word. I was just brand new Christian. All I said is Jesus. And it was like a grenade. Went, Poof. And I had about 30 seconds of peace. And there it was back on me again. And all of a sudden, it come on me and start talking to me. I'm trying to shake it off. I couldn't shake it off. Come on. And all of a sudden, Jesus. Poof. And it just came back on me again. It got me to a point after four hours I wanted to kill myself. Come on. Because I knew if I took myself out, it would stop. At least I thought it would. Yeah. And when everything got to a peak, all of a sudden, yeah. and the power of God hit me in the middle of the aisle in the grocery store. Yeah. And I was shaken under the power of God. There was like 2 a.m. There was no customers. I was literally shaken under the power of God. Yeah. And Jesus came. He said, remember, he goes, I'm the one that heals and delivers. Yeah. And I was raised Catholic, and I didn't believe God talked to people, but one experience changed my theology. Yeah. And I didn't know. I was like, that's Jesus. How do you know? I don't know, but I know that's Jesus. Yeah. I didn't know. Come on. The next night, I convinced myself that never happened because God doesn't talk to people. He doesn't care about people. He doesn't answer prayers. I got to go to a priest, to a medium, to go to the in-between, you know, for my sins forgiven. That can't happen because it violated my theology. Come on. The next night... It came into my life again. That time, it was a subtle power that came upon me. Yeah. And he said, Jesus just called you to the ministry. Yeah. He said, my job is to teach you and train you because he's coming back for you soon to call you into the ministry. Come on. I was like, that's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Had no teaching about the Holy Spirit. How did I know? Something in my spirit knew that that was the Holy Spirit and that was Jesus. The call didn't come from man. That's good. I met pastor. Yeah. And... When I met pastor, I didn't want titles. I didn't want anything. I just wanted to serve God and everything else. But when Pastor Vince came into my life, he said that you're going to eventually be in real estate. You are called to the ministry, this, that, and the other. And he told me all these things. It was seven years later yeah. that I finally went into real estate. What did I do? I took the prophetic word and I just put it on the shelf. I said, okay, but I don't feel it right now. I'm broke. I'm $7 an hour. You're saying, hey, I'm going to be worth millions and all this other stuff. For me, it's kind of crazy talk right now. $7 an hour isn't much, and that was a big word, but God speaks to my potential, so I didn't know much. I said, well, God, if you're going to do it, then do it. I'll just put that thing on the shelf, and when you're ready, I'm ready. Just right now, I just don't feel it. Seven years later, I woke up one morning. All of a sudden, the call, the desire just came on my life to go forward and do it. Yeah. He called me into the ministry 22 years ago. I spent 17 years serving at the back row as an usher. Because pastor said it's going to take years to, to get to the level of your call and to develop your anointing to, you know, be where you're supposed to be. And so I knew it wasn't going to be a right away thing. I knew I just had to serve and put in my time and just continue loving people. And God spoke to me in the back of the church and he said, you called to be the executive pastor. And I said, I don't want it. I said, I just want to do what I'm called to do. And I just, I don't want to do a title, God. And it's just my humility and false humility, whatever. He said, God, I don't want to do it. Everything, everything, everything started falling apart in my life. And God came back to me again. He woke me up early in the morning. He said, all of the trouble in your life will cease as soon as you accept who you are. And you're called yep. to be the executive pastor of this church. I said, well, cool. I said, well, then tell my pastor because I'm not playing that game. Yeah. <laughs> right. I met with pastor. <laughs> we went out. We had, we had Starbucks. And I said, hey, pastor. And I don't think he knew at the time. I knew God, I already had a word. But I took pastor and I said, however you want to use me, just let me know. And pastor goes, okay, I'm going to pray about it. We'll meet back here in five days. And we met back in five days. He goes, you pray about it? And I'm sitting there laughing. I'm like, yeah, I'll pray about it. I already got a word, but, you know, I'm kind of like, well, you pray about it. So we met, we met like five days later. And he starts laughing. And he goes, man, I, I, I never saw it. He goes, you're my executive pastor. I'm like, well, there you go. Praise God. I never saw it on my own. Never asked to speak. Never asked to speak. But he identified, you know, the word that was in my life. But pastor called it out. And Pastor Vince called it out. And the reason I bring this up is there's heart issues. I had to stay under great men of God and stay coachable. Yeah. Never been through Bible school, but I serve men of God. And I glean from the anointing that's on their life. The success that they see of business is on my life. Because I stayed planted in this house. The success that's on Bishop is on my life. I stayed planted in this house. I stayed submitted to people. And I kept my heart right. And I stayed aligned with people. I wasn't looking for any title in this church. I'd still be an usher if that's what God had called me to be. Because the blessing can hit an usher as much as it can hit a greeter or somebody in the worship. It doesn't matter. Stay in your lane. 
faith and do what God's called you to do and the blessing will come upon your life for your faithfulness. Amen. Titles are all about ego. And God's not in the egos. God promotes people that aren't looking for that position. That's good. I've never asked to preach. I didn't ask to preach today. A pastor called me earlier and said, you want to preach? I'm like, yeah, okay. I got a word. So, you know, it's, it's something I do. My ministry right now is just blogging. And I reach the young church right now through the blog. It's at Life Change Church Seattle. Yeah. And I do a daily devotional where I send it out there because there's a lot of people that are hurting. And there's a lot of people that you don't see that text me saying, yeah, thank you, that really helped my life. But it creates relief for the people that are hurting that aren't ready to come into church because the church hurt their lives. Yeah. Right. They need to trust in people. They need to trust in God before they're going to step into this church. That's why we're doing life, life uh, groups as well. Right. So... Let me talk about ownership, and then we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Right. Acts 19.11 in the Passion Bible. You getting hungry, Pastor? This is Passion Bible. Come on. I'm getting excited. Let's get it. What are we at here? Acts 19.11 in the Passion. This is awesome. It says about the extra, extra, extraordinary miracles in Ephesus. It says, God kept releasing the flow of extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul. Because of this, people took Paul's handkerchief and articles of clothing, even pieces of cloth that had touched his skin, laying them on the bodies of the sick, and diseases and demons left them, and they were healed. Good. Now there's a comparison. So watch, we're going to shift gears. Now there were seven eminent Jew ex Jewish exorcists, sons of Stephen, the high priest, who took it upon themselves to use the name and the authority of Jesus over those who were demonized. They would say, we cast you out in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. Wow. One day when they said those words, the demon and the man replied, I know about Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who do you think you are? Yeah. Then the demonized man jumped on them and threw them to the ground, beating them mercilessly. He overpowered the seven exorcists until they all ran out of the house naked, and they were badly bruised. Oh. It worked for Paul, why didn't it work for the seven sons of Sceva? That felt good. There was a comparison. Oh. It's showing you right there. It worked here, but it didn't work there. So good. Why didn't it work? Because one person had ownership of a revelation. That's right. And he could release the authority of God into any situation because he owns something. Glory the other God. people were renting it. Come on. They had no ownership. They just heard about it, but it had not hit the heart. And the enemy realized when they spoke there was no power released, and they were renters, not owners. That's right. And because they were renters, there was no authority in their lives. Glory it didn't work for them. I pray for some people, and they're like, well, well, what did you say, and how did you pray? And did you really grab the anointing oil and, and do all this other stuff? I'm like, no, I just, God told me to just boom and speak something over life, and all of a sudden, hip shifted, and things just worked themselves out. Yeah. I've seen a guy with liver cancer through one or get healed. That's right. I've seen the cripple that we talked about took his cane. God said, today's his day for a miracle. Command Carlos to come forth. Yeah. All of a sudden, boom, within a week. He was no longer crippled. He had cartilage in his knee where there was no cartilage. He was walking without a limp or a cane. That's right. Amen. Dorothy came in. She two weeks. I don't know how she got her shoes on, but her swollenness of her ankles, I don't know what else to call it, was over her shoes, and it looked like her shoes were painted on her feet. It was, it was that bad. Yep. I walked in. I pointed to her when I walked up to the altar. I said, you're not going to leave the same. Yep. And that was faith. I don't even know why I said it. And I walked up to the altar. I said, oh, my God, why the heck did I say that? And God speaks to me. I said, God, what are we to do? He said, command capillaries to open. I said, that's awesome, God, but you know I'm not that educated. I don't even know what the heck a capillary is. <laughs> I literally got my phone and I went on to Google and I said, what's a capillary? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, they're the little veins in the hands and the feet. I'm like, that's God. Okay. I walk up to Dorothy and I start laughing. I said, watch this one. I said, capillaries open in Jesus' name. And all of a sudden she said her feet, she could feel her toes shifted in her shoes. Yeah. And then when she got out to the car, the swelling left. And by the next morning, the swelling went completely down. She's been walking around there for two days. What I'm trying to get at is I'm trying to get about sonship and relationship. And it's not about an equation. It's about a relationship. Right. It's about seeking God. It's about getting a word from God. Because the Bible says that no word from God will come into your life without God's power and ability to perform the very thing he's speaking. Why do I seek words from God? Because God's going to put power and authority on his word for my life. It's by his grace, not mine. My job is to understand the plan. Yeah. God reveals his plan to a servant the prophet. Well, that's Old Testament. God reveals his plan to his children. And John 10, 27 says, my sheep know my voice. Right. And they won't follow the voice of a stranger. So I'm in a new covenant. I'm qualified. You're qualified to follow the way of the love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14 and 1. 
So you're qualified to hear the voice of God. Yep. And God's trying to get something in your life so he can get ownership in you and create change in your life. To shift somebody else's season. Good. But he's got to do it for, in your life before he can do it in somebody else's. So, when we do worship, worship's an invitation. That's right. Invitation for ownership so you can own your peace. To get a word from God, to get a healing, to get ownership. Like I said, when pastor preaches, it's to get a word from God. Right. Why? So you own something. When you search it out. Yeah. That's why when I do first steps, I tell them to fill in the blanks. Yep. I said all the other scriptures, you take it home and you study it. Why? Because I'm not going to give you my revelation because it'll be here today, not tomorrow. Matthew 13, look at the parable of the sower. Right. It's based on your pursuit, pursuit that that thing will produce in your life. Good. Amen? Amen? Prayer. Prayer is an invitation to, to receive and own your daily bread. Good. Obedience. I like this one. In Hebrews uh, 5 and, and 17, in the Passion, mm-hmm. it said, And because of his perfect devotion, it's talking about Jesus, his prayer was answered and he was delivered. But even though he was he was a wonderful son, hear me now, he learned to listen and obey through all of his sufferings. <laughs> he learned to listen and obey through the bad times in life, through his, what season? Suffering. His sufferings, his desert, the place that sucked. Yeah. That's where he learned to hear God. <laughs> Why did I say have a joy when your life sucks? Because yeah. it's the place you learn to hear God. Yeah. Yeah. Now watch this. It gets better. And after being proven perfect in your place that sucked, because Jesus says, I perfected your suckiness. <laughs> I perfected it. Right? Yeah. He said that. I perfected it. Come on. He has now become the source of eternal salvation to those who listen to him yeah. and obey him. That's good. Wow. So he's saying, I've already been there, guys. And that's why I have mercy over you. Because I know what it's like. It kind of sucks. Yeah. But Jesus said, I learned to yeah. listen and obey in that season. Yeah. And because I perfected it and you now follow me, you're going to learn to do the same thing I did. You're going to learn to listen and obey so you can be made perfect in that thing. Yeah. So you can walk in and out because you have ownership and you have authority over that season. Amen. So, yeah. That's pretty awesome. Glory. All right. Matthew 16 and 19 in the Passion. Well, I'm going to wrap it up with this. I love this one. This one tripped me out. I saw this afternoon. It's in this new Bible pastor called The Passion. <laughs> and the Bible part is going home with me. You can pray all you want, but I'm not hearing it. La, la, la. God, I'm not listening to you. <laughs> all right. Matthew in The Passion in 16. And Jesus says, And this truth of who I am will be the bedrock foundation which I will build my church, my legislative assembly. And the power of death will not be able to overpower it. I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven and to release on earth which is released in heaven. So if God is forbidding certain things, sin, sickness, and death in heaven, why are you allowing it in your life? Why are you giving it a voice? God said, I forbid it. And he's saying that he wants you to forbid certain things here in this life and he wants you to challenge it. But then he says he wants you to release certain things because he released it in heaven. So it says, and to release on earth that which was already released in heaven. Well, heavenly experience, it says Revelation 21.4. It says he'll wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. For the old order has passed away. No more death, mourning, crying, or pain. Is there any death, mourning, crying, or pain in your life? God forbids it. And he wants you to live. But then there's this awesome scripture that actually confirms it. So I go to this one. In Matthew 10 and 6, it says, Go instead and find the lost sheep among the people of Israel. Yeah. And as you go, preach this message. I like how it says it. Heaven's kingdom realm is accessible. Good. Close enough to touch. You must continually bring healing to the lepers and to those who are sick. Watch this. And make it your habit to break off the demonic presence from people. And raise the dead back to life. Freely you have received. uh, Excuse me. Freely you have received the power of the kingdom. So freely release it in the lives of others. Wow. So now when you have ownership over something. They said to freely release it in your life. So it says here. And to release on earth that which was released in heaven. And then it says. And to freely release it in the lives of others. God's trying to get you in a place of ownership. 
Matthew 10, 52 says, God's trying to get you in a place where you're an owner of a general store. That whatever it is that people around you need, that you'll be able to grab the resource and release it into your life. Yeah. But you have to take ownership over it first. And I'm telling you this, guys, the invitation for ownership is always there. Wow. But it starts with an invitation and respond to it. You have desires in your heart. That's the invitation. Mm -hmm. That desire, that thing that ticks whenever you open the word. Every time I open the word, it hits something in my heart. And it pulls something out. And it's God calling to do great things. But it's just an invitation. And until I actually start searching it out, what's going on here, then it just stays in there. And it slowly dies. That's when it says hope deferred makes a heart sick. But it says a desire fulfilled, meaning a desire connected with God's heart in his kingdom is a tree of life. It's the time in life where you start to live. Go ahead and stand your feet. So good, brother. It's not over. It's just beginning. I'm telling you that prophetically. You're here right now, and, and I don't just say this. There's many people. I won't say demons. There's many people that have tried to take you out because of the source that they've been connected to. There was a boy that came in here about two weeks ago, and Art dealt with him. He was full of demons. And I got the call as soon as I got in the parking lot. They're like, you're kind of called to this deliverance thing. And there's a crazy dude saying, I'm hearing voices. Seems a little schizophrenic. Can you go deal with him? I said, yeah. I said, I own some stuff. And when I grabbed his hand, I let him know. I said, I love you and Jesus loves you. And I break that thing off your life. And he starts crying. And I said to the demon, I said, I command you to go. And I heard the voice. I'm not going anywhere. Another voice came out of him. I said, oh, yes, you are. And he starts crying. I gave him a hug. I knew it wasn't done. Art ended up, you know, knocking it out of the park with the kid. But then Jen came up to me afterwards and she said, why weren't you afraid? I said, here's what you have to understand. Everybody's connected to something and everybody serves someone or something. He was a servant of the demonic realm and God says that realm has no power. It was cast down. He's just a servant. I said, I'm the servant of God most high. And I'm connecting to those powers. You better get this in your spirit. Because of who you are and greater is he that's in you. You have nothing to fear because who you're connected to. I don't care how many voices, tens of thousands of demons may be in somebody. Going crazy, coffee shaking, whatever, spitting all over you. At the end of the day, they're a servant of an inferior power source. The Bible says a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near your house. It won't touch you. I'm telling you that the angel of the Lord encamp about you, that you are protected. God will lift you up so you will not strike your foot against a stone. The word in the work that God began in your life, he'll complete it. Psalms 138 and 8 says that he'll perfect everything that concerns you. Yes. What does that mean? He'll perfect. He will work on the desire of your heart to make sure it's done. Watch this one. Pastor said this. I'll bend the will of people. You think I'm playing? The Bible says that when things get topsy-turvy, God will nail it down and he'll put it in its place. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 and 12 in the message, nothing, nothing is impervious to the word of God. Nothing is impervious to the word of God. My grandma told me when I was 19 years old, she said, you may be out of my hands and you may be out of my reach, but not God's. That was the scariest thing I've ever heard from a four foot 11 Italian woman. <laughs> When she said that, that freaked me out. They gave me the willies. But she was right. Because I'm standing here. I was a knucklehead. I did everything wrong. I destroyed my own life. But God resurrected my life from the dead. And if he did it in my life, it speaks prophetic to your life. Because the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. God can use my comebacks in your life because he's no respecter of persons. I'm just one example. Sean's got a story. Doc Mark's got a story. Jimmy's got a story. Roy's got a story. There's so many people in here that have stories of breakthroughs in their lives. Grab hold of their success. Grab hold of their story. God says, when he says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, the word testimony literally means do it again. God is the I am. He's the God of the present, not the God of the past. And the Bible says today, if you hear the voice of God, it says don't harden your hearts. 
Because today is when the promise comes alive. Today is when the I am God steps in and he starts taking things. Go ahead and close your eyes. Today is the day. Today is your day. No more playing around with God. No more playing around. Don't shrink back. Keep your eyes closed. My job tonight is to get you connected. If you've fallen back and you feel like, you know what? I slipped, I fell. Grace is there to catch you and lift you back up. If you felt like you slid back a little bit, I want to pray with you. And if you don't know the Jesus that I know, the God of restoration, the God of comebacks, I want you to enter in. So if you've either stepped back or you just don't know Jesus, on a count of three, I just want you to get your hand in the air. And I want to pray with you and I want to minister to you. One, two, three. Go ahead and get your hands up. There you go. I see that hand. I see that hand. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and put your hands down. I'm going to go ahead and pray for you. If you lifted your hand up, come see me after service. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you for the connection. I probably was the biggest knucklehead of them all. But God restored me. And Father, you saved my life. I wanted it handed all twice, Lord. But you wouldn't let me do it because it was too important for other people to touch their lives. Father, you said the good work that you began in people, you're going to complete it. And so, Father, we lift up the hearts of the people to you, Lord God. And Father, I ask that you restore each and every person, Lord God. And Father, I ask that the people would taste and see that you are good. Father, when they taste you, they experience you. When they see you, they perceive you. Father, I ask that you break people's theology, what they thought about you. You're a good father. You're a good father. And you're a perfect father. I can't trust in anybody, but I can trust in you, Lord God. And you said when I trust in you, I don't have to understand. I can just trust in you. And you said when I trust in you, Lord God, you would not put me to shame, Lord. So I trust in you, God. And, and Lord, I thank you that you won't put me to shame. That I can step out and you'll step with, you'll step there right with me, Lord. But Father, I ask for a healing and restoration, Lord God. Father, that you would turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons, Lord. There's people in here that have father issues and have abuse issues. And Lord, it led to substance abuse. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're healing those hearts right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, the unsearchable that's in their heart, I ask that you bring it forward for their repentance, Lord God. And Father, I ask that they release it now in the name of Jesus. Father, the offense against family, the offense against brother, the events, offense against sister, and the offense against father. Father, I covered in the blood of Jesus. And I ask for a restoration to take place. I ask for your people that have repentant heart and a forgiving heart, Lord God, that you would lift them up, you would restore them once again. That you would restore them, Father. And the church said, Amen. 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 Guys, service is dismissed. I hope you got some. And if you need prayer, just come on up.